Hello, PAC members, and welcome to the February PAC Appreciation Event. I'm so excited to join you this month. My name is Jocelyn Yerian, and I recently joined the Dog Aging Project team at Texas A&M as the social media specialist. So if you haven't already, go find us. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, YouTube. So thank you for joining us today. I look forward to getting to know all of you here and at the dog park. We've had a busy start to the year as our team works on all new things coming your way in the months ahead. Today's event has been pre-recorded, but it's gonna remain on YouTube. So you can watch this video as many times as you want and more importantly, you can share it. So make sure to share. Also, our team will be answering questions at the dog park. So if you're not familiar, the dog park is our community forum exclusively for PAC members. So PAC members, if you're on right now, make sure to head over to the dog park, sign in, and don't forget to enter in our prize giveaway where you can get some dog aging project stickers. Also, we have some really big news we wanna share. The Dog Aging Project reached a milestone last month with our debut in the scientific journal, Nature. It's a very, oh, we're so excited. The paper was titled, An Open Science Study of Aging in Companion Dogs. It's a wide ranging introduction of our program to the global scientific community. So what does this mean? Well, it describes our research methods and the types of data that scientists will be able to access through the Dog Aging Project. So thank you. Thanks to all the contributions of community scientists like you. We made it happen, thanks to you. And <laughs> while many of you have been with us months or years, this introduction to researchers worldwide is super significant to an open data project like ours. We are so excited to begin sharing data in the, in the year ahead. Also being an open data project means that scientists elsewhere might be able to investigate questions we never thought to ask, or more importantly, make independent discoveries. So this is exciting stuff. We're excited, we hope you're excited. If you'd like to learn more, make sure to visit our video description box where we have the links to the summary of the manuscript and the link to the paper itself. So go check it out. Now, one of the perks of the Dog Aging Project is that we can be talking about research papers one minute and then watching puppies play and learn the next. <laughs> our research program wants to follow dogs all across America, young or old, large or small, city dogs or country dogs. We love them all because every dog has something special to teach us about healthy aging. But working dogs always take a special place in our imagination. Their skills show the special bond between humans and dogs, but it doesn't always come easy. This month, Dr. Amber Kaiser spoke with author Elizabeth Rush about avalanche rescue dogs. Liz wrote a children's book called Avalanche Dog Heroes, following the training of a border collie puppy at a ski resort outside of Seattle, Washington. So without further ado, take it away, Amber. I am so excited to be here today to talk to my good friend and fellow author, Elizabeth Rush, about something I'm super excited about, avalanche dogs. Woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to just hand it right over to you, Liz, so you can tell our viewers uh, about the book you wrote about avalanche dogs. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me, Amber. Um, I share your love of dogs and also really admire the Dog Aging Project. So it's a thrill to be here. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And OK, um, so um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I write children's books. Uh, for basically birth to young adults. I also do magazine articles. Um, I've written about 22 books now, but at one point I had written more than a dozen books and um, had never written a dog book. And I really, really wanted to write a dog book because I love dogs. And um, this is a picture of my dog Reba when she was a puppy. And um, I just always wanted to write a dog book, but there are so many dog books out there that I didn't know what I could add to the story, what I could add to kind of the library of information about dogs. And then I heard about um, this group called the Cascade Mountain Rescue Dogs. And I heard that this group of dogs are trained to find people when they're buried in avalanches. And I thought, I just had so many questions like, how do they do this? How do they find a dog? And how do they find people buried? And how are they trained to do this? And what kind of dogs do it? And so I thought that might be kind of a, an approach or an angle that I could take. And um, I have a background in journalism. So one of the things that I really like to do is interviews. So 
one of the first things I tried to do with this book is um, I tried to interview the dogs. And um, as most of you know who have dogs, it's really challenging to um, communicate with a dog and, and really understand how they do what they do and what they're thinking. And so I had to kind of think about, well, what's another approach I could take here? And it turns out that these avalanche rescue dogs have people called handlers. And um, the handlers are the people who often are the caretakers and owners of the dogs, but not always. Sometimes the handler and the owner is different. But um, in this case, I was gonna be writing about a dog named Piper. And um, her handler, Sarah, uh, said that she could kind of show me how this whole dog, avalanche uh, rescue dog thing works. So I settled for interviewing people. These are three uh, 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 ski patrol people at Crystal Mountain, which is a resort outside of Seattle, Washington. Um, the one on the far right with her handout is Sarah Cohen, who is the head of the rescue dog program and also Piper's handler. So uh, this is one of the best things about my job. When I got to, uh, to do the research for this book, part of that meant putting on my skis and going to Crystal Mountain and hopping on the gondola with Sarah and Piper, um, riding up to the top of this mountain, also riding lifts with her and really seeing her do her training and do her work. Um, so some of that was kind of tricky because it was also kind of chasing Piper and Sarah as they were running down the slope or across the slope on skis. And I was also on skis, but I had my notebook in my pocket and I was like, I wanted to like stop and write down what it was like, you know, and how Piper was able to kind of move back and forth across the slope, almost like dancing with Sarah. But I also had to keep up and they're really, she's, Sarah's a really good skier and Piper's a really fast dog. So that was a, a bit of a challenge. I also got to slow down with them a little bit and really watch the training of these dogs. So um, Sarah, when she's working with Piper, um, she teaches very much through kind of positive training, through rewards, with treats, and like playing tug. And uh, by doing this, Piper has learned over 80 cues. So she knows 80 commands. So simple things like sit and stay and down, but also like in this picture, catch it, where, she, you know, uh, uh, Sarah's holding a toy and throws it in the air. If she doesn't say catch it, Piper's not supposed to try to go catch it, but if she says catch it, she's supposed to try to go catch it. So she shows her what to do and also what not to do. Um, she's also taught her to stop in her track. So if she's running down the mountain and, and Sarah sees something dangerous, she'll say stop and Piper will stop immediately. She can get her to spin around. She can even say like go through, which means go through my legs. Um, and one of the most important um, cues that she's learned is search. So I really wanted to understand how a dog could search for a person who's buried under snow. And um, it's really all about the nose. It's all about the dog's nose. So dogs have these incredibly powerful noses at the end of their snouts. Um, they can smell 44 times better than humans. So some of it is they have these really spongy kind of wet outside um, that helps them grab the scent. Um, they also have a, a really different structure to their nostrils. So we sort of have just one round nostril and the air goes in and out in the same place in our nostrils. In a dog, they, in, they inhale through the wide open nostril, then they exhale out the sides. And so what's important about that is that they can bring uh, air in and bring scent into their nose and then they can exhale without losing that scent. They don't then blow that, kind of wash it away um, by, you know, bringing, by blowing out that scent. Um, so it's this kind of cycle that they can actually like fill up their nose with scent. And a lot of times if you see your dog, like, like they're sniffing multiple times, they're kind of filling up their, their, little, their little container in their nose that holds scent. Um, they also can smell separately from each of their nostrils. So if they smell something over to the right, they smell it in there and they can tell that it's to the right because the scent is stronger in their right nostril than their left nostril. And then they do have this compartment. And in this compartment, 
they have tons of uh, scent receptors. They have 40 times more receptors in their nose than humans do. And then the other part that uh, dogs use when they're searching for someone buried under the snow is their brain. So they get the scent and then that message goes to their brain and one eighth of a dog's brain is dedicated to smell. So it's a lot about the way that they, it's a lot of how they understand the world. And that is kind of the tool that is used to do this avalanche dog rescue work. Okay, so Sarah has taught them all kinds of, has taught Piper all kinds of cues. We know that they have really powerful noses, but how do you actually get a dog to search for something buried in the snow? Well, it's basically like uh, doing kind of a game of hide and seek that gets harder and harder and harder and harder. So at first, when Piper was just starting out, um, they would have a ski patroller like hide behind a tree. And then uh, Sarah would say, search. And then Piper would go bounding off around the tree and they'd give her a tree and say, oh, you found the ski patroller, that's so great. And then they would uh, send that person further and farther, further away. And then they would try hiding them behind a big bank of snow you know, maybe standing up or showing a little bit and then, uh, you know, lower down. And then they started digging holes in the snow so that the person was partially submerged and say search and have Piper go find uh, the person buried in the snow. And then as she got more and more skilled, they would actually dig a snow cave and um, put someone in it and then cover the top of it with these like ice chunks. So it's a kind of like a little chamber under the snow. And um, and Piper would, uh, when told to search, she would, you know, sniff the air for the scent. She would run around through the snowy area trying to pick up a scent. Um, this is a picture of one of Piper's actual drills. So a drill is when they're kind of training her to, to search. And so she made, she started way up on the upper right-hand corner of this giant slope. Um, someone was buried kind of three quarters of the way up in one of these snow caves. And you can see that she sort of went back and forth and back and forth across the slope looking for a scent. And then she thought she had one. She went kind of straight uphill. She stopped and sniffed and then went straight to that person. So a lot of it is about her trying to catch the scent, figure out am I closer to it? Am I farther away? Which direction is it? And meanwhile, her handler is just trying to, um, you know, kind of, uh, keep her alert, um, you know, watch, uh, maybe give cues like, um, you know, up here that she, the handler may move to a different section of the slope and try to pull her into maybe where the wind might be blowing. Um, so it is a little bit of a partnership, but it really is Piper and these giant fields of snow. They're like a hundred meters by a hundred meters. So like two football fields, giant field of snow that she can find someone uh, buried in the snow. So um, one of the things that I got to do when I was doing research for this book is I got to see Piper's certification test. So she's a three-year-old border collie, and she had done a whole bunch of training. Um, but in order to actually be an official avalanche rescue dog, you have to pass a test. So the certification requires that um, in a, you know, a big snowfield without Piper or Sarah knowing, um, they bury two ski patrollers in these caves and they bury three sweaty sweaters. So they, so the ski patrollers have these sweaters, they sleep with them, they hang on to her a few days, they get them kind of gross, and then they bury those as well. And the reason they do that is that kind of mimics if someone is buried deeper in the snow, because that lighter set will be even harder for um, the Piper to find. Um, so she had to find, so they buried two ski patrollers and three sweaters, and she has 40 minutes to find both ski patrollers and at least two of the sweaters. So I'm going to read you a little bit uh, from the book about her certification test. So this is, this is photography from the actual test. Uh, she is in a run out to an, an avalanche. So it's where an avalanche has happened some time past. And so you can see all the debris. Uh, Sarah and Piper do not know where, um, where anyone is buried or where any of these sweaters are. So Sarah just kind of tries to figure out, you know, where's the wind and, and kind of put her in the right place before she gives the command search. 
Sarah lets Piper off the leash and crouches down next to her facing the huge search area. Piper, this is it, Sarah says. Piper snaps to attention. We have a lot of work to do. Piper steps a paw forward. Search, Sarah says. Kim starts the clock. Piper bounds through the snow, weaving up the slope. She heads into the middle, running fast. Suddenly, she stops, and her head snaps back. Did she smell something? She sniffs a bit, but continues across the slope toward a cluster of trees. Sarah trudges higher up the hill. The wind is blowing upslope, so Sarah wants to position Piper where the scent will drift toward her. Piper, this way, she calls. But Piper ignores her and runs back to the middle of the slope where she had paused before. She stops and sniffs, but she doesn't dig or bark. Piper spends a few minutes in the smooth powder outside the search area. Sarah lets her sniff there for a while. Suddenly, Piper turns and runs straight to a spot, sticks her nose in the snow, sniffs, and digs furiously, snow flying. Sarah rushes over. Piper yanks a sweater out of the snow. Oh, 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 Sarah calls in a sing-song voice. Nice job, Piper. She yells to Kim, we have a strike. Sarah kneels down next to Piper and plays tug with her crooning. Good job, good job, Piper. Oh, what a good job. But the clock is still ticking. Sarah tucks the sweater into her backpack and says, back to work. Piper dips her head to the ground, sniffs, and trots, trots off down the slope. She weaves around and picks up speed. She heads straight for something. She circles a spot, stops, and digs. Sarah skis away, but Piper won't follow her. She keeps digging. Sarah reads this as victim loyalty, a clear signal that Piper thinks she has found someone and she is not going to leave until help comes. We have a strike, Kim yells. But will Piper find another person and another sweater and pass the test? You can find out in Avalanche Dog Heroes, Piper and Friends Learn to Search the Snow. I have so many questions. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, here's my first question. Um, it's when in what you read, Sarah seemed to make this kind of a game and the training is almost like a game. And there's this really, like she uses that excited, positive reinforcing voice too. So would it be different if it was, if there was really an emergency and someone like, it seems like you would still want to encourage your dog that way, but that for Sarah might be really hard if you're like, oh my gosh, somebody could be dying under the snow somewhere. Yeah, I think that's very true. And, um, but Sarah is also very aware of the signals that she needs to give Piper. So like, even with this test, Sarah said she was really nervous. Like she didn't sleep well the night before and she didn't know if she made the right decision having Piper do the test because it was springtime and maybe it was too warm and she'd be panting and she wouldn't smell. And did she, you know, just she had a lot of stress about it. I mean, obviously not as much as if someone was actually buried under the snow, but she said that she, well, part of what she has to do as a handler is manage that stress and learn how to breathe and to be calm because Piper will read her signals and you know, she will intentionally use a very bright, happy, excited voice. So it, it does uh, feel like a game to Piper. But I think she also, like when Piper found the first sweater and, you know, was playing with her, you could also also see this switch when, when Sarah said back to work, like she was very serious and Piper was very serious. Like, so they were able to kind of go back and forth between this kind of playful game thing. And like, you're actually a working dog. Like you have work to do. And um, Piper seemed to really appreciate both of them. That's really interesting about the certification process too, because it seems like it would be not easy, but it would be a thing to, to train a dog to find one thing and then, yay, you did it, you're done but it seems like a whole other level of training then to be able to say, okay, good job. And now we got more work to do. Right. And, you know, it, it was also amazing that, you know, she found the first sweater, I think in the first three minutes, she found the second thing after like another five minutes, she found the third thing after like another two minutes. And 
Piper's young. I mean, a three-year-old dog is also can be very distractible, right? Yeah. So to be able to focus for 40 minutes on the same task over and over and over again, and no matter what the conditions are, I mean, that takes a really special dog and a, and obviously a very, very well-trained dog too. Do you have any idea, like if, if there's like a, um, an age range at which avalanche dogs are sort of at their working peak? Um, so as I said, uh, Sarah was a little worried about getting her certified at three because that's pretty young, but she, she did feel like she was ready. Um, you know, from like four on till, um, I'm trying to think what the other, the other dogs on the team, you know, were like seven, eight, nine, and 10. And then, you know, then they retire because it's also, it's quite physically challenging, right? To be running through the snow, running up and down the snow, following someone on skis, digging, you know, they do get lots of rest time um, in the huts and, you know, very well taken care of with their health care. But it is, a, it is a, a, you know, it's a very physical job. And so they will, um, you know, as a dog gets older, they will retire them and then they'll just hang out with their handlers and play for the rest of their lives. Are there any particular kinds of dogs that are most well suited for the work? Yeah, well, so the dog has to um, be smart, right? Trainable. Um, they have to be agile. They have to be able to actually run through snow that can be quite different conditions. It could be like patchy, deep snow plus chunks, right? So they have to be very agile to move around. Um, they have to be eager to please, right? So they you need that connection between a dog and a handler. Um, they also have to be warm, right? They have to have like fur, thick fur and thick pads on their paws so that they can uh, be really hardy in the snow. Um, so a lot of the rescue dogs are actually labs. So there are a lot of um, chocolate labs and yellow labs. Um, there are also our border collies, which are very smart and very furry. Um, Piper's best friend, Darwin was a, um, Oh, uh, what's the, um, the duck, the duck retriever. Um, oh shoot. I can't remember the name. <laughs> they, they look very alike. Like Piper, they called them, um, they called her, gin, they called Darwin ginger snap because she was kind of red and white and Piper's, you know, black and white. So it was like ginger snap and Oreo, these two dogs that were super close friends. So they don't have to be, you know, purebreds or anything like that. They just have to you know, be warm and smart and eager, eager to please. Um, and also big enough too, right? They have to have long enough legs so that when they're sinking into the snow, um, they, uh, they, they can stay above the snow, but they also can't be too heavy because there are also times when um, Sarah would say like, you know, up and, and, and Piper would jump into her arms and she would, and Sarah would ski carrying her down the slope or, um, uh, you know, help her through a really difficult icy patch or something like that. So they also have to be not like you wouldn't have like a Newfoundland or a St. Bernard because they're kind of too big to scoop up and actually travel with down the trail. It's a bummer for all the chihuahuas out there. <laughs> the chihuahuas. The out there. I'm sorry, you're going to have to find a new career path, my friends. <laughs> it's not going to work. There's probably other work for them because they probably have excellent noses as well. <laughs> Uh, so is there, I mean, they're not really using visual cues at all, or, I mean. Well, you know, when, when Sarah is about to encourage Piper to search, she will turn her body the way that she wants Piper to go. And she will kind of go search and take points in that direction. And then there are also times where Sarah will move her body to different places, almost as if she's hurting Piper to certain areas. She's not very heavy handed with that though. She's not like come here right now or go this way right now. It's more like a suggestion. Like they have this lovely relationship kind of, you know, Piper is very aware of where Sarah is, but no, she's not supposed to, you know, run back to Sarah, but she may kind of notice like, oh, Sarah's moved you know, a little, quite a bit left on the slope and kind of maybe follow her a little bit um, as she's sending. So there aren't a whole lot of um, visual cues. Also, you can't have a lot of visual cues because you don't know what the conditions are going to be like. I mean, it could be 
white out, you know, really bad visual conditions during uh, a search. So it has to be something that, um, that they can do, she can do from a distance and still um, be able to have that kind of call and response um, impact on the dog. Do you have any sense of how, like how many ski areas have avalanche dog programs? Is it fairly common or? Yeah, I think it's quite common in the West. Um, um, the other thing is that this, the certification is also region-wide and there's certain levels, like you can be certified to be an avalanche rescue dog in your, at your resort. And then you can have a higher level where you can go to, to other resorts um, and search as well. Um, and so, you know, there, there, there could be times when, you know, they're really dangerous conditions somewhere where someone doesn't have, they don't have avalanche rescue dogs and maybe some dogs would come in for some period of time um, or, you know, just kind of as a safety, safety backup. Um, and, you know, as I was looking, I did find that, you know, a lot of, especially in the West, a lot of resorts in the West do have avalanche dogs, but it is also, you know, you have to devote a lot of time to training, right? Two or three years of training and they don't, you know, you have to pay the handlers to, they have to be there all the time because what good is having an avalanche rescue dog unless the dogs are there and the people are there and they're ready to go. And often a team will be more than one, right? It'll be like four or five dogs. So you're actually paying like or five full-time salaries. Um, so it is expensive. So they have a, they also have a nonprofit um, where you can, you know, donate to dogs and the, um, the health care for them, keeping them in really to top shape. And those are often through the resort. Um, like, uh, you know, Crystal Mountain has their own kind of nonprofit to support their avalanche rescue dogs. So my home mountain is Mount Bachelor, and we have an avalanche dog team. And one of the things that they do is they have a special t-shirt every year. And so we like have a whole collection of avalanche dog t-shirts, all with different graphics for every year. That's part of how they raise money. Um, yeah, Crystal Mountain too. And I have a couple of those as well. I know I should have worn one today. I totally forgot to wear my avalanche dog shirt. Um, so I actually have a couple slides to show too um, to our viewers. I um, part of the reason I wanted to talk to you about this is I have this great personal story about avalanche dogs too. So I'm going to show share my screen, and introduce everyone to a couple of the avalanche dogs at our mountain. There are, I think, five or six dogs in the team right now, um, but Riggins, Banyan, and Mango are some of them. And I think it's kind of interesting, too, just thinking about what you said about weight and everything. So these guys, like Banyan's 55 pounds, the other two are bigger. Um, you can see their handlers, their birthdays. So a couple of years ago, um, my daughter and I had the opportunity to participate in a junior women's ski patrol clinic. And so a bunch of tween and teen girls and their moms and a bunch of women ski patrollers at our mountain spent the day together and the girls, you know, sledded each other down the hill in toboggans and put each other on backboards and they did a beacon search in the avalanche beacon area. And they also got to meet some avalanche dogs and they asked for a volunteer to be buried in a snow cave so that Mango, one of the avalanche dogs, could go look. My daughter threw her hand in the air really fast. And so she got buried in a cave. And here's a little clip. It got cut off kind of a little bit quickly, but here's a little clip of what happened. Ready to go to work? And this is like <laughs> <laughs> so mango went right there and as she's digging so uh and you see her handler went with the shovel to go help um i thought it was really interesting that we had this whole group of girls all around and mango was like totally focused so they're uh 
there on the left is Mango pulling my daughter out of the cave. Here she is, super happy afterwards. Um, and they had given her a tug toy to hold in the cave. And then Mango dug until he found the tug toy and then used that to kind of pull her out. So I am in love with these dogs. At our ski hill, we don't have a gondola, so they jump on the chairlift next to their handlers. Super cool. Yep, they say, uh, at Crystal, they do that too, because it's not all gondola service. So she'll say, uh, load up. And she jumps up just like she's jumping onto a couch. <laughs> so, cool. so cool. And then her little tail is like flirting, you know, hanging back over the, the chair and it's kind of flopping in the breeze and her ears are all you know, <laughs> flowing in the breeze. So awesome. Uh, I want to remind everybody that the title of your book is Avalanche Dog Heroes by Elizabeth Rush. It's won a lot of awards. It's a wonderful book. So if you have young people in your life who love dogs, they definitely need this book. And thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. And have fun out there in the snow and with the dogs. All right, that concludes our Avalanche Dogs event. Thank you so much for joining us today. A huge thank you to Elizabeth Rush and Dr. Emma Kaiser for sharing their knowledge and experience with Avalanche Dogs. That was super insightful and fascinating. I personally didn't even know that was a profession, let alone a program that existed. So I know I learned something new today. Hopefully you did too. To all our Avalanche Dogs and handlers out there, thank you so much for all the hard work you do and for making a difference. And for all our PAC members who are currently watching and participating in today's PAC event, thank you so much. We are truly grateful and we appreciate you and your continued support of the Dog Aging Project. Truly, thank you. And oh, don't forget, if you haven't already, make sure to head over to the dog park if you haven't already and enter in our prize PAC appreciation giveaway. We're also gonna announce the winners there. And if you have any questions, we're gonna answer all the remaining questions on the dog park as well. So make sure to head over there. And speaking of the dog park, a quick shout out to Eric. He's the dog father of the dog park and our tech guru behind the scenes. He put this wonderful event together. So thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Also really quick before we go, we wanna share some quick updates. We'll be focusing on canine cognition in the next few months. So stay tuned for some upcoming blog posts on our website and as well as some social media posts. So wait and see. <laughs> And don't forget to like and share this video and like and subscribe to all our socials. So like I mentioned earlier, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and of course YouTube. So thank you so much. We woof you. And thanks for joining us. Until next time. Bye.